Welcome to Thursday, June 24. This is our class session in Math 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations. This is our Thursday session where we just practice some problems and go through a couple discussions. So I think we got some good problems to practice with you and some good discussions to have. But remember, if you want to ask a question and your question will come first. Here are some questions I jotted down. There's sample problems that might be good. These are some ideas that we could talk about, you know, briefly or at length. Uh, it could be very brief or they could be more entertaining. If I can show you a couple Laplace transforms, how Laplace Laplace transform examples, how Laplace transform deals with polynomials and sines, cosines, and the first shifting theorem, then you're going to be way, way ahead as we try to break the tape next week. Remember, this is where we were. Let me put the sheet of paper under here. I got a little camera lag right now. So, don't let that distract you. This sheet of paper was where we were just ticking off Laplace transform facts that we learned. And we could tick off quite a few of these today to get you in a good position to go forward with minimal effort. And that'll help you not only do your homework problem that's due tonight, but consume our presentation next week much more easily. So that's my philosophy right here. That's what I'm looking for right here. Okay, I got too much lag here. Let me try this. I am going to plug in the ethernet cable directly and terminate the Wi-Fi connection. That's what was causing that lag. Okay, this might be better. Let me, this might be better. Okay, I think I was on my Wi-Fi network instead of directly plugged into the ethernet. So that caused an issue. So uh, let, let me give you a chance if you want to say what you'd rather do first, but this is outline. Here are some sample problems. Unless you have a preference, I'll tackle these in the order from simplest and quickest to more educational. Okay. Let me talk about why you do power series in general, because you're doing a homework problem for tonight where you actually flex some power series muscles. This is not a sophisticated or, you know, deep, deep thought right here. But think about power series like this. Power series are infinite polynomials, right? And, you know, polynomials are among the first things you learn in algebra. So as people developed lots of theories in mathematics, there's, there's two schools of thought for how they worked on this. First of all, maybe someone had a grand, grand dream that everything in the universe could be explained with polynomials. Uh, you could go pretty far with that, right? As soon as they allowed you to use infinite polynomials, then you started covering sine function, cosine function, exponential function, you learned natural logarithm. You could cover lots and lots of functions. So you could think of power series as a leftover from the day where people thought they could conquer the universe with polynomials. I don't think that's an exact historically accurate thought, but there is a lot of work that happened in mathematics trying to look for the perfect polynomials or the best polynomials. And power series, you know, are kind of a conclusion that came out of that. There's lots of conclusions and tools in mathematics that were 
hot and exciting in the 17th and 18th century that you've probably never heard of because maybe you want to say they didn't pan out or they didn't prove useful. But then sometimes accidentally they come back and prove useful. Uh, an example that you may or may not have heard of is continued fractions. What in the heck are continued fractions and why would anyone want to use those? Well, you could, I'll let you Google it and see what you come up with. But not everything that people invent over the years in mathematics is something that we still use actively today. Maybe it'll be something we use actively tomorrow. But that's kind of the category power series are in. Okay. Next, you gave me some very entertaining answers from the problem in 4.3 and 4.4. And so I was inspired to try to illustrate the answers to that problem. And so I have posted a notebook a Mathematica notebook on our website, you know, playfully called Fast 13 Trailer Concept. I kind of enjoy movies, you know, movies can run to everything from the sad, to the scary, to the deep, to the escapism thing, you know, you can enjoy movies wherever you like them. But I posted a notebook where I said, can, you know, can we figure out, I don't wanna to go to that link right now, but I might open the notebook for you. Is there a way to figure out how to talk about this speed bump problem? So I remind you the speed bump problem had two parts and I'll just open this notebook just to help you see some visuals. And then you can decide whether this is correct or that is correct. Let me open the speed bump problem here on my desktop and share that with you. Good, got it. So this is a problem from the book. It's number 24. And I altered it by adding a second part. I've already made this comment. So suppose, suppose the suspension of average car can be fairly well modeled by an underdamped oscillator with a natural period of two seconds. Can you answer these questions? How far apart should the speed bumps be placed so that a car traveling at 10 miles an hour over the speed bumps will bounce more and more violently with each bump? That question was in the book. And I think there's a definitive answer to that. Although I pointed out last time, this idea of more and more violently, I'm not sure entirely what the authors were aiming at since we're under damped. So maybe they were just being casual in their language. But then the second part of the problem I made up and thought about just because, well, isn't this a natural question? If you went a little bit faster over the speed bumps, could you, you know, so, so to speak, defeat the speed bumps, make it so that you're not having to go up and down in the same fashion, right? So I think part A has a clear answer and I'm still reading your papers because you had all kind of interesting solutions, qualitative solutions, that's what I was looking for. And, but just everybody just about agreed on part A was that you should set the speed bumps about 30 feet apart, 29 and a third feet apart to be exact. Remember, this is a model. This is not reality. This is what our model might tell us. But I did get a variety of answers in part B. That's why I'm still reading them. And even when they were different, the answers tend to be good. You know, you, you gave me an answer and you justified it. But then the question is, well, is there one answer to this part B? And I'll be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm willing to show you what I thought I could mock up as an answer. 
And so when I was reading this problem, I did not detract points from part B at all. I just, if you answered part A correctly and your reasoning was responsible, if your reasoning in part B was responsible, whether or not I agreed with the answer, then I considered that five out of five points. Let me show you a Mathematica notebook that might help us answer the question. And this notebook is posted on our website as I just showed you, if you want to investigate it. So let's roll over to this Mathematica notebook, if I can find it. Zoom, zoom, zoom. I have Mathematica notebook open, and now I gotta see if I can find it on my desktop, so hang in there. Just give me a second here. Okay, there's the notebook. So I should be able to share it. There it is, okay. I, was, I have too many windows open, that's real. That is an issue. I think I'm taxing my poor computer. Okay, let me work on maybe increasing the size of this type so you can read it. So I also wanted to have fun. I mean, what's the sense of doing this if you can't have fun while you're doing it? So yes, I'll admit to one of my guilty pleasures is I've watched you know, Fast and Furious movies. And, you know, just like any franchise, some are good, some are better. Some you probably don't want to watch twice. But I thought, well, this would be the perfect setup for Fast and Furious movie, kind of joking. However, I will warn you a little bit seriously that I don't think I have perfect code in this notebook. And some of you have discovered you can ask Mathematica to do something that's too hard, kind of hangs Mathematica or hangs your machine, you know, just going into some kind of endless iteration or asking it to do some kind of calculation that's too intense for it. So don't be afraid to play with this notebook. It won't damage your computer, but if it hangs up, you might have to force quit the application or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever is the equivalent in Windows. I forgot what we call it in Windows. But the motor vehicle action sequences depicted in this math mathematic notebook are dangerous. I, I do not, I jokingly said, what if we went and simulated this in a parking lot? Well, yes, you could, but uh, don't do anything that causes risk to people. At least this is only a mathematic notebook. It's only a computer simulation. All the simulations here were performed in controlled environment with professionally trained mathematicians and sandbox kernels. So no attempt should be made to duplicate any action or driving car play scenes here in portrayed. But a more serious question as you scan through this notebook, is this really true? Is this really going to work? Is, is, your, is your differential equations model really reflecting reality? So you might want to ask this question, where would this model, this differential equations model breakdown? I'm not going to discuss with you how I wrote these equations yet, because some of it deals with chapter six, but I do want to show you some images. So here we go. I say we could model the suspension by an underdamped harmonic oscillator, and they wanted two seconds. So you could pick the P and Q. You could pick the P and Q to be many things, but let's say P was a simple number like two. That would give me the real part of my oscillation is minus one e to the minus t. And if you picked minus one as the real part of your complex pair, then to get a period of two seconds, this is the Q you would pick, one plus pi squared. This was not required for you to do this problem. I just saying how could I translate it possibly into a differential equation. And this models a car suspension in a way, you know, go over the bump, pop up, pop down, 
oscillating, and pretty soon it dies out. The book asked for one period to be two seconds and we have delivered. And the second period is much smaller in magnitude and third period you hardly even feel, right? So let's model one speed bump. This is the thing you have not seen yet. And this is the impulse function that we've hinted at, the hammer blow, so to speak. The function is called the Dirac function in physics and mathematics. And it's implemented in Mathematica with the function Dirac delta. So here, I just changed the equation by adding a speed bump at two seconds. Car is driving along, hits the speed bump at two seconds, goes through its little oscillation, quickly returns to normal. Do you see, start at two, repeat at four, repeat at six, okay? Now, what we're interested in is multiple speed bumps, right? So we could add more speed bumps by adding up more Dirac functions. We just keep tapping this car's suspension with a speed bump in a sense. And that's what we've done here, setting this up so that at every two second period, this car hits another speed bump. That is what you all decided was about 29.3 feet, 29 to third feet. And here's the result. Car goes over speed bump, tries, comes back, whacks again, whacks again. I think this is what the author intended, except it does not get more and more violent. And we discussed that last time in the presence of damping. I'm not sure what the authors meant by more and more violent or whether they were just being casual. But certainly this is gonna get your attention, right? If you're going over the speed bumps, 10 miles an hour, apparently if they're placed 30 feet apart, this is the vertical motion you feel, possibly. This is our model. Remember, it's only a model. Now let's increase the speed. So let's go over speed bumps every second. What would that mean? That would mean you're going at twice the speed, literally twice the speed. And so that's 20 miles an hour. Now you could compare that to the one above. You, is this, is this more violently? Or maybe this is what the authors meant by more and more violently. Or is this a lesser change in amplitude as time goes on? You could compare these two pictures and decide. So this is at 10 miles an hour, this is at 20 miles an hour. Okay, you know, we could debate which one was more violent. But now we got a plan. If I can change the speed just by changing the time interval, what I could do is maybe I could write it so that I could change the speed at will. Maybe we can make a movie. So lights, camera, action. Why don't we make a movie where we could input the speed V in miles per hour and get a response from the car's suspension? So the answer with the V right here is where I input miles per hour. And if I input 10 miles an hour, I get the picture I already saw. If I input 20 miles an hour, I get the picture I already saw. What about 15 miles an hour? Well, it seems a little bit bumpy. You know, like you're going down, you're coming back. That seems still a little bit, how about 25 miles an hour? This is interesting. It looks like 20 miles an hour. But here the mountains at 20 miles an hour are a little taller than the mountains at 25 miles an hour. But I'm also no longer touching the horizontal axis. Let's try 30 miles an hour. The mountains are smaller, but now I'm noticeably above the vertical axis. Now the vertical axis is measured in feet. So 10th of a foot, about 1.2 inches, 2 tenths of a foot, about 2.4 inches, right? 
okay, I know what you're saying. Like, uh, I'd like to compare all these pictures together. Let's compare all these pictures together. So you could actually just set up four plots, 10 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour, 30 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour, and then graph them together. Now we're going to get interesting. <coughs> 10 miles per hour upper left, 20, 30, 40 in red. As I increase the speed, I get um, these more rapid bumps, but the more rapid bumps are smaller in amplitude. But side effect, I don't know if I like this, I am further displaced from the ground level. Now, this is an interesting question. Am I simulating someone racing over speed bumps? Well, if we need to simulate street racing or racing in a parking garage or a parking lot, I think we need to call in an expert. So let's try to set up a manipulation. And because I wrote that plot structure, I wrote this function called answer, what I could do is try to manipulate plot structures for different speeds from 10 miles per hour to 40 miles per hour. And this is the part where you want to be careful. I, if you want to pump this up to 60 miles an hour or something, you're going to use more computer juice. But I think that this animation is going to be fair. And let me turn it on. And again, of course, the problem here is animation with you and the video lag, that's an issue, but let's play it. Going forward and backwards. It's a crude animation of what we thought we saw. As we increase the speed, let me slow it down. As we increase the speed, let's argue, are the violence of the bumps getting less as I ski over the speed bumps? Am I skiing over the speed bumps? Am I in contact with the ground? You know, I think we could argue about how to interpret these images, but you can't deny it's an interesting start. Okay, I'll let you play with this worksheet at your leisure, but this is our trailer pitch to Universal. I think there is, you know, now, Depends on how you count the fast movies, right? Uh, it, it, is it Fast 11 that's about to come out? And then if you count the Hobbes movie, you know, the what's the movie, Shaw and Hobbes? Is that one of the fast movies? Okay, I, I think most of the fast heads would say Hobbes and Shaw is a fast movie. So that means we've got 12 fast movies, depending on how you count the spinoffs. It's a little bit like the Marvel Comics universe where you got like 23 movies and rumors, braggings of 20 more projects in production. I don't think I can take that. But anyway, I'm just thinking if you got 12 fast movies and you are being generous, then we're trying to give them the pitch for the 13th fast movie. So here it is. Now, notice I'm going for 100 miles per hour here. So this might take a second. Computer's thinking, that's the black bar. I've already got the answer printed here in case this failed. Computer's thinking about this. I'm going to be careful and let it think. It might think for as much as 20 seconds. It popped up to here, it went back to the animation. I think I've got my cursor back here on this line. This is the result of my model going over speed bumps that are 29 and a third feet apart at 100 miles an hour. Is this realistic? It says that what happens at 100 miles an hour is I hit the first speed bump and I whop, jump up to six tenths of a foot which is seven inches, presumably off the ground. 
Now we're going to have to talk about off the ground. Is off the ground the wheels? Is off the ground the body? The suspension? You know, that's really the question is how does a real suspension behave? Because I'm hitting speed bumps even as I say the body of the car is six tenths of a foot off the ground. The body of the car presses back down on the suspension. So assumed in this drawing is that the wheels have never left contact with the ground, possibly. I don't, you're, we're gonna have to interpret this, right? But as I jump up, the body of the car jumps up, the body of the car goes through a little decaying oscillation, but then I settle in do I settle in to a pattern where the body of the car is more than a half a foot displaced and the wheels and the suspension are just thumping over the speed bumps, lickety split? I think this is for you to consider. Is this a less violent way to go over the speed bumps? I'm not sure it's a responsible way to go over speed bumps. I don't even know how we could test this unless we were really on a closed track. But it looks like you're skiing over those speed bumps with little violence. Now, before you say this is totally worthless and why would you ever spend time bringing this to us? Let's think about this again. Since I could not simulate this with a car, I was trying to think about where can I simulate this or have I ever simulated this? Why don't you think likewise? I came up with an idea where I have simulated this. And that is, I don't know if you know, you car, bicycle, I think a bicycle is safer. Have you ever rode your bicycle? And let's say I could give you a specific example of riding a bicycle on the rail trail that goes between Midland and Coleman in Michigan. I always assume people are in Michigan when they're taking this class, but you know, it's between the city of Midland and the city of Coleman, there's a rail trail, former rail line that they converted to a bicycle trail. It's very nice. Sometimes I like to ride my bicycle on that. And it's very well paved, but sometimes you come across the former railroad bridges, which they did not pave with asphalt, but they did fill in securely with wood planks. And as you run over those railroad bridges at speed on your bicycle, you get jarred relatively violently. Now, it depends on what kind of bicycle you're running, right? But let's just say no particular suspension on your bicycle. You're coming up to that railroad bridge and your question is, should I slow down or should I power through? Now you're gonna be jarred either way. But if you have a bicycle and you like to perform this experiment, I would submit to you that if you power through the railroad bridge, you might experience something like this blue curve. And particularly if you don't stick your rear end on the bicycle seat, because that is not as comfortable as doing what? Standing up off the saddle and letting your arms and legs absorb those shocks. So as you're going over those bridges that are covered with planks, letting the bicycle absorb many shocks very fast, ask yourself whether you're experiencing this curve. Okay, you just want to create a word picture. So you can go and run this notebook as you like, but I am you know, serious. If you pick crazy, don't pick a thousand miles an hour. If you pick crazier speeds, even 100 miles an hour, you saw the machine take 20 seconds or so to give me the picture, right? Maybe my commands are not written very efficiently, but it's just an attempt. Okay, good, I like that. 
So um, back to the paper. And I'm going to put this away right here. So it's not eating up computer cycles. So those are just kind of the fun things I wanted to say to you. And now we can knock out some pick problems or we can go to these Laplace points. I maybe I'll start by knocking out a problem. So we did show you a lot of Laplace transforms last time. We definitely showed you, well, you know, a couple. We're on the verge of showing you a lot more. We showed you the Laplace transform of E to the AT is one over S minus A. I guess when I say a lot, this is thousands and thousands of Laplace transforms here, right? One different one for every A. We had this qualifier that S was greater than A. Pretty soon we're really not gonna worry about that, but maybe you wanna see me write it so I can be honest. Let us do one more Laplace transform, possibly, and then let's try one of these problems here in 6-1. Let me see what I got. Maybe one of them is accessible right away. 6114 was kind of a reverse engineering problem. 6123. I think I should even try 6121. Maybe that's where I'll start. Okay, the reason I'll pick 21 is because it only depends on this formula. And one more the Laplace derivative formula, which says the Laplace transform of a derivative of a function is equal to S times the Laplace transform of that function minus the value of that function at zero. This is a very important rule that we're going to use a lot today. So with those two tools, just those two, I can actually show you how to solve a differential equation. Let's take, for example, got everything working. Okay, that looks good. Uh, 6.1, number 21. Then possibly we could work ourselves up to a problem that more resembles your problem on the homework. So 6.121 says this, y double, oh no, y prime, just a single derivative. Your homework has two derivatives equals minus y plus e to the minus 2t, that looks good, y of zero equals one. So here's what I mean by the Laplace transform eats derivatives and spits out solutions. Let's just look at this very, very naively. By that, I mean, let's go straight forward, straight ahead through it and see what happens. Because I know how to take the Laplace transform of a derivative. And I know how to take the Laplace transform of an exponential. And apparently I'm giving this data that I might use in the process. So this is like the golden rule of mathematics, right? Whatever you do unto one side, you do unto the other. So I'll just take the Laplace transform of both sides. This black pen is running out. Let's discard it. And I don't think I'll color coat for very long because you know, that will get distracting. Okay, on the left-hand side, I'll replace Laplace transform of Y prime with S L Y minus y at zero. S L Y, I'll color code for a short time here. Blue and black don't differ very much, do they? Oh, sorry, minus y at zero, which is one. Good, on the other side, I will pull this apart with the linearity of the Laplace transforms. Wasn't I allowed to say that I could pull out any constant 
and separate any two functions. Okay, this is the linear de Laplace transform from our sheet. Now I have a plan. I'm solving for y, right? So I think I want to get my y's together on one side and everything else on the other side. That's an algebraic process, right? So I'm going to take s ly and add ly to both sides. And if it doesn't have a y in it, let me keep the y's black for a second. If it doesn't have a y in it, I ship it to the other side. That means I'm going to add one to both sides. I didn't need to write the plus sign, but that's okay. And take the Laplace transform of e to the minus 2t, which according to my form is 1 over s plus 2. Okay, good. Now look what I've done. Actually, I got L of y showing up twice on the side if I factor out the L of y. And I have this equation. Now I'm just producing algebraic steps, right? And if I actually solve for L of y by dividing both sides by s plus 1, I think I'm going to stop color coding now. I have 1 over s plus 1 plus 1 over s plus 2 s plus 1. And I could claim I'm done. I've solved for y. And, and you're going to say, well, no, 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 you did not solve for y. This is not y. This is not a function I can insert into here and check. And I say, certainly I've solved for y. y equals this. Say, no, no, you, you told me what the Laplace transform of y is. But now think of this analogy, like, a dictionary between French and German. You know, here's our differential equation in French. And I've applied a dictionary to translate this into Laplace land. Let's say the Laplace land represents German. I've turned a differential equation into an algebraic equation. This is the heart of the Laplace transform. And I do truly have the solution here. This is why. But it's written in Laplace land. It's written in Laplace language. This is written in German, so to speak. What I have to do is translate it back into French or English or whatever language you want to work with. I have to translate. Now, this is where most of your work is going to be done with the Laplace transform. I need to translate. So I need to say, where does 1 over s plus 1 come from? Well, I recognize that from this form. If I have s plus 1, then a must be minus 1. So this piece comes from that piece. But I've yet to translate this, and I don't have a formula that looks like it yet. You cannot just say e to the minus 2 times e to the minus 1t, e to the minus 2t, e minus 1t. You can't multiply them like that. We're going to find out later that that's no good. We'll have to dream up another fix. But you remember a trick from calculus. You remember that you used to separate fractions like this. And the game was called partial fraction decomposition. Now, we might demonstrate partial fraction decomposition a little bit later. And I'm, I'm sure we will, especially next week. And I've got some videos and handouts on site to help you with that. But I'll just tell you how this one shakes out. I think I can tell you how this one shakes out. Uh, let's try. Do I have to go and execute it? That'd be funny if 
if I had to go and actually execute it. So if this is a one and this is a minus one, I think, am I that lucky? That's just, and, and maybe you did it faster than I, maybe you're saying, where did you get those? But I tell you what, if you add these two together, common denominators, you do get one over S plus two times S plus one. So this is legitimate partial fraction decomposition. Definitely check out our videos and maybe we'll do some demos of partial fraction decomposition later. So that means to translate this, I need to translate these two. And that just becomes another E minus T and this negative of E minus two T. So now I have my solution. I can add together the two E minus T's. Solution, Y of T equals two E minus T minus E minus two T. Remember, we're in differential equations, not in history. We don't have to wonder whether this is true. We can check whether it's true. If you differentiate this and insert it into here, you get matching sides. Derivative is minus two plus two on the coefficients right there. And then the minus two is gonna come from there. And if you add that, then you get plus one. Well, I guess I should just do it instead of talk about it. Minus two e to the minus t plus two e to the minus two t. But then I compare that to the opposite of this, which is minus two e to the minus t plus one e to the minus two t. And I have to add another e to the minus two t. And when you add these two on this side of the bar, it equals exactly the same as on that side of the bar. And it meets the initial condition. So what do you think about this? This is your first Laplace transform problem. Maybe you've seen this before though too, but it's the first Laplace transform problem that you and I have done together. This is slick. I take a differential equation. It looks like I didn't do anything. It almost looks like I did no work. I did some algebraic work. I didn't, did I differentiate? Did I integrate? Did I do separation of variables? Did I worry about YP, YH? Did I worry about interference? No, I just mechanically, algebraically solve for the problem, solution, and then translate it back. So now we've solved our first differential equation Laplace transforms. And there we are. Now it's gotta get busier than this. We're gonna talk about much uglier driving functions in this one. We generally like to hang out in second order problems, right? So this is just a beginner problem. I understand that. But in the beginning of chapter six, all the problems in 6.1, except for the one I gave you, are first order problems. Excuse me, first order problems. So here's what we need to do to pump this up to second order. And to try some other tricks. We need to knock out a few more formulas on this sheet. Let me show you the ones we could easily knock out. I think we could easily knock that one out. And as it happens, without too much more work, we could knock that one out. I'm dashing these because we haven't done it yet. 
Uh, then, with two tricks from below, you can knock out this. A little algebra will get us these two. Do you notice that the functions, or the, do you notice that the, uh, table that I wrote down is, you know, six functions, column, two columns. The, actually, the columns kind of correspond to each other, right? If you know cosine, do you know sine? If you know eliat, do you know tneat? They, they actually work in pairs. And so that, with one more tool, would give us these two pairs as well. So that's what I could do for you right now today and it would be worth it. And it would definitely help you make your homework problem easier. In order to get these as smoothly as I promise, we do have to reach down here and relook at the Laplace transform of derivative. Here's one derivative, right? What about two derivatives? What about two derivatives? What about three derivatives? Although we don't do differential equations with three derivatives yet, really. How about four, five, six more? Here's a Laplace transform dealing with any number of derivatives. The parentheses n here saves me the trouble of writing lots of primes. This is n primes, this is n derivatives. So if I could show you why this formula is true, which is not difficult, but we haven't done it yet, then that, and if I can show you, dip into one of the big three down here. I can show you why this formula is true. Again, it's not difficult. We haven't done it. Then what we've done is knocked out now way more than half of this sheet. So I think that's the program that I'm gonna pursue. Let me knock out some of these polynomials. That's what I wrote on our outline for today. Let me knock out these two polynomials. Then I'm gonna dip down here and knock out derivative, second derivative, third derivative formula, knock out the shifting theorems, and then I can pick up all these other ones that I've marked. Okay. Let's try that program. Then we can do more interesting problems. So first thing we're gonna do is say, here's a key formula. What the Laplace transform does to a derivative. S times Laplace transform of the original function minus y at zero. With this formula, I can work out what the Laplace transform does to one, what the Laplace transform does to t, what the Laplace transform does to t squared, what the Laplace transform does to t cubed, and so on down the line. Any power of t that I wish. And then once I have any power of t that I wish, then by the linearity, I have any polynomial. So before I do it, I'll tell you what they are and show you how this knocks out any polynomial. And then I'll come back and show you how I got them. So you can read this on the formula sheet, but we haven't proved it yet. Laplace transform of one is one over S. Laplace transform of T is one over S squared. Laplace transform of T squared is two over S cubed you'll start to see a pattern. Laplace transform of t cubed is six, six, excuse me, 
over t to the fourth. Now, in case you're thinking about the pattern, I'll write it down here for you exactly. It's written down on your sheet. Laplace transform of t to any power n is n factorial from you know, your old power series days times s to the n plus one. That's where I got the six over t to the fourth. Three factorial is three times two times one. t to the three plus one is t to the fourth. So that means if I wanted the Laplace transform of say uh, negative three t squared plus 2t minus 7, the Laplace transform of any polynomial, how would I set about this? Well, by the linearity, I would break them up into three Laplace transforms, minus 3t squared. When you do this for real, you'll do it much faster without this writing. First, you just split them up into three chunks, and then you factor the constants out of each chunk. But you're gonna do this mentally. You're not gonna do it by writing when you get used to this. Now here, I'm gonna be kind of slick. I'm gonna factor out the constant minus seven, but if I factor this out, don't say that there's nothing left. Remember, factor means multiply. So when I factor out the minus seven, what's left is the Laplace transform of what? One. Now, I've got these basic Laplace transforms that I know by heart. After you use them enough, you do know them by heart. And so I just insert. I insert Laplace transform of t squared, two over s cubed. Laplace transform of t, one over s squared. Laplace transform of one, one over s. And that is the answer. That is the Laplace transform of this. Now you could, you could simplify this a bit, I don't mind. I warned you against adding them together necessarily, that's not wrong, but sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. So if I was writing this personally, I would just multiply the constants and write minus six over s cubed plus two over s squared. And am I gonna say minus seven over s or minus seven over s? I, it doesn't make much difference. As long as you account for the negative signs correctly, you're okay. Now, what have I done now? I've showed you how to do the Laplace transform of any polynomial, right? Uh, there's a caveat. I haven't shown you this formula is true. I haven't shown you that this pattern is true. So, we do need to demonstrate that this pattern, really that pattern right there, Okay, well, let's do it. Let's do it. It's not gonna be so hard using this key formula. So let's take, just for example, a generic function f of t to be one. Let's take that to be our basic function. You know, very boring function, one. Let's put it into this formula, Laplace transform of f prime, the derivative, is s times Laplace transform of f, we showed you why this formula was true last time, minus f at zero. 
And let's fill in the blanks. F at zero is the same as F anywhere else. It's equal to one. That's not a big deal. F prime, the function F prime is actually zero, right? Because this thing has no slope. Everywhere, no slope. So this is literally the Laplace transform of zero. But whether you buy that, do that by the definition, like let's take out a zero. See, I got two options right there. I could do this Laplace transform of zero. Sorry, I wrote the paper up. I could do the Laplace transform of zero two ways. I could physically remove the zero and be left with a Laplace transform of one. And then say zero times the Laplace transform of one has to be zero. Of course, that bothers you because I haven't told you the Laplace transform of one. But on the other hand, who cares what the Laplace transform of one is? Zero times anything is zero. Well, from your calculus days, you know that that's, uh, that's a, kind of a dicey statement. You know, sometimes in zero times infinity in determinate forms is not zero. But that's a functional statement. But yeah, well, this is a functional problem, isn't it? How about let's try it like this. Let's do the Laplace transform of zero by the book. And nobody can argue with me. E to the minus st dt times zero. But that's the integral, the area from zero to infinity under the function zero, zero times e to the minus st. And the net area under the zero function from zero to infinity is clearly zero. Okay, so I can do this those two ways, I get zero. Why am I doing this? Because I want to discover what the Laplace transform of one is, right? My function is one, but now I've discovered it. I will subtract one from both, uh, sorry, I will add one to both sides. I will divide both sides by S and the Laplace transform of one is now one over S. Uh, your first reaction is that's too silly. That's too silly. You could have done it by the definition too, but I've knocked this one out. Now your next question then is gonna say, but how long is it gonna take you to knock all the others out? And the answer is very, very shortly. Watch this. So let's knock all these other out. Let me get this slide down so I can see my formula. But instead of doing them one at a time, I'm gonna do them all at once. Let's try it. Let's let my f of t, uh, there's different ways you can do this. I'm gonna do it the way I want to do it. Let's let that be one over n plus one times t to the n plus one power. And let's insert this into here. Notice that f of zero is zero. When you put zero in for t, you get zero out. So what I have here is Laplace transform of the derivative of f is equal to the Laplace transform of F times S minus F at zero. But because of the cool way we chose F, this piece is gone. Now let's look at these two pieces. What's the derivative of F? Because of the cool way I chose F, the derivative is what? Laplace transform of T to the N. But now we got to put f of t into here, right? So I do s plus transform of one over n plus one 
f of t. Well, that was t to the n plus one. I don't have to write f of t anymore. And I don't want to write minus zero. I'm, okay, I'll write minus zero, but only once. Okay, let's keep going. What I have right here, let's factor out the one over n plus one. Laplace transform of t to the n plus one and Laplace transform of t to the n. And now let's turn this around. Let's multiply both sides by n plus one over s. I'm taking my time writing this very slowly because it's an algebraic sneakiness that I'm doing. So it could be disconcerting if you've never seen someone do this before. Now let's turn this around left to right. And I got it. I've got all of them at once. Watch. Now, somehow I'm gonna, right, somehow I'm gonna lose this that I can't do that and that at the same time. Well, how about if we do the fold the paper trick? I don't always like the fold the paper trick because that ends up making a mess on the desk anyway. Let's do the fold the paper trick with my new found formula. Now let's do Laplace transform of T. According to this, that means N is one. And if n is one, I get one over s times the Laplace transform of t to the zero. n is zero, sorry. To do t, Laplace transform of t, I'm gonna take n equal to zero in this formula. That's Laplace transform of one. But I know the Laplace transform of one. It's one over s also. Result, one over s squared. Got it. Let's do the Laplace transform of t squared. That's when n equals one. So let's put a one in for n. I get two over s times the Laplace transform of t to the one. But I've already done the Laplace transform of t to the one. It's one over s squared. I mean, literally, it's two over s times one over s times one over s. Or I could have wrote one over s squared. But what is that? Two over s cubed. I'll just do one more and then I'll leave it to you that you could do all of them. Let's do the Laplace transform of t cubed. Now n is two. n is two and I put in the formula, get two plus one is three over s times Laplace transform of t squared. And I take the Laplace transform of t squared is two over s cubed or if you allow me to write it so you can see the pattern, I'll write this whole two over s, one over s, one over s. What do I get on the top? Three factorial times one, which doesn't do any harm. How many s's do I get? Four s's. That's six over s to the fourth. Okay, now, with this derivation, and you can continue this forever. Now, if you want to get formal and nasty mathematically, how do I know it works at 100? Well, I have to do the first 99. Of course, that's called proof by induction, which we could do, but it's not on our schedule today. We're, I think you probably believe me that this works. <coughs> but believing and proving is two different things. So now, with that key formula and this observation, I can do any Laplace transform of any polynomial I please. And if you want to think about that, that also means, does it mean any infinite polynomial? Okay, we might have to discuss that. Okay, so we've done Laplace transform and polynomials. So, Let's try another example. Let's try the uh, 23 that I marked on the paper. 
I am kind of concentrating on Laplace transforms. Oh, I guess it's time for a break too. So here, let's do this. Let's take a break. I'm gonna do problem 23 with you because that involves a little more work. If you wanna dip into chapter four, appendix B, you let me know and I don't have any problem. Here's a nice problem from appendix B. But I was kind of trying to mop up some cool Laplace transform facts. So let's take a break. Let's come back at, I sorry that I went over the top. Let's call it 113 just to give you time to stretch your legs. And then we'll come back. I'm going to mute my microphone while I stretch my legs.
Okay, excuse me. Okay, we're back. And we're gonna move along here. So I don't wanna presume anything, but, and I'll listen to you, but I definitely wanna show you some of these Laplace things. And so I'm gonna stick, I'm gonna stay in this Laplace stream unless you direct me otherwise. So let's look at 6.1, number 23. This will get you closer to working on your current homework problem. Maybe you've already done it. So let's do one more first order. And this doesn't look more complicated. But this time I've put a polynomial in there. Simple polynomial. Okay, so what are we gonna do with that? I wanna make sure that I'm numbering my papers as I go along, so. Everything up in order. Got it, got it. Got it. Let's look at this problem. We'll do it exactly the same way as we did the last one. We'll just apply the Laplace transform and get going. And as you go on doing this, and go to the higher order problems, it's not tricky to apply the Laplace transform. It's just you have to keep track of exactly all your coefficients and everything nicely. So that's the focus. Focus on what you're doing. I'm not going to color code this anymore. That will slow us down. I'm going to take the Laplace transform of both sides. You understand I could have wrote Laplace transform of y prime, Laplace transform of minus y, Laplace transform of t squared. I could accelerate this in any way I feel comfortable. But this is SLY minus Y at zero. Here's what I mean by accelerate it in any way I feel comfortable. Now I have minus LY plus a little plus transform of T squared, which we just worked out was two over S cubed. So I just did that directly instead of separating it and then doing it, right? Now you're gonna get used to this drill. There's my LY. I'm gonna bring them together so I can isolate them. I'm gonna put everything else on the other side. You're even gonna get used to factoring out the LY quickly later, but I'll show you the factoring step a couple times today. Both piece seven LY, I factor out the LY. That leaves S plus one. Now I can divide by S plus one and I can decode my Laplace transform. I'm trying to keep two papers in the window at the same time. This is page four today. So let's try to decode this. This is truly the answer. One over S plus one plus two over S cubed. S plus one. But now I'm gonna to start to suffer a little bit because like I had to do partial fraction decomposition on the previous problem, I have to do it here. Now I have to make a decision about how to proceed on this, right? I definitely want to just, just I definitely want to demonstrate partial fraction decomposition for you. 
a couple times. But those can get out of hand. They can use up a page or half a page. And that's not what we're being paid to do directly. Although you could ask yourself, if you can't do the partial fraction decomposition, how can you approach the problem? You're gonna to have to depend on someone else. You're gonna to have to depend on a machine. That's not a good plan. So I will show you partial fraction decomposition here, but I'll make this agreement with you on your homework or exam that you never have to show me the partial fraction decomposition that you perform the actual partial fraction decomposition form. You can get that from a machine. You can get it from Mathematica. I'll show you how to do it on Mathematica. But even after you have the partial fraction decomposition, there is sometimes some rearranging that you're going to have to be able to do yourself. So let's remind you how to do partial fraction decomposition. You know, first I'll say this one's already prepped to go. I already know that one over S plus one comes from E to the minus T. That's from my sheet. Right? So there's nothing to decode there. It's this that has to be decoded. It's this that has to be pulled apart. And partial fraction decomposition goes like this. You base it on the linear factors you have basically one fraction for every linear factor. But you also learned that if you repeat linear factors, like this is s minus zero times s minus zero times s minus zero, you actually have to build up to that situation. Each one of these has an unknown constant on the top. This is four equations, four unknowns, but in this problem, that's not too threatening. Now remember, I'm gonna do this once as a demo. I do not expect you to write it like that way, but you can consult my demo videos or do the partial fraction decomposition as you were taught. So what I need to do is take a timeout and bring this down. How do I find out what A, B, C, and D are? Even if you have done this before and you're proficient at it, I think I might say a word here that would help your understanding a little more. And I know there's all kinds of magic tricks to do this too, but some of them don't work in this case of repeated roots. So listen to this presentation. I'll multiply everybody by denominator, common denominator. Why? Because I hate fractions. So you write this out. And when you multiply this denominator times each piece here, some things cancel, some things don't. You get an AS cubed. Here you get a B, S squared S plus one. Here you get a C ss plus one, here you get a d, s plus one. So the thing that I just wrote, that line that I just wrote, it's true, but it's not useful. How am I gonna use this to find the a, b, c, and d? What I have to do, and I like to say it like this, is I have to turn this right-hand side inside out I've written it from the perspective of A, B, C, and D. I'm featuring A, B, C, and D, right? What I should rather do is write it from the perspective of the powers of S. S cubed. S squared. S. And the constants. That's what I need to focus on. Because that's what I have over here. A constant of two, zero powers of s, zero powers of s squared, zero powers of s cubed. That's going to allow me to compare. So let's do it because this is not too messy. It's not hard to do. 
How many S cubes do I have? Let's scan. I have A S cubes. Here I will produce a B S cubed. I'm just scanning from left to right, from highest power to lowest power. I also produce a BS squared, but that's the next time. S cubes in here? Nope. S cubes in here? Nope. I'm done. Those are the S cubes. Likewise for S squared. None here. There's a BS squared when the BS squared strikes the one. There's a CS squared when the C strikes, the CS strikes the S. There is no S squared here. Let me finish it, filling it in. How many S's? None, none. CS plus DS. How many constants? No constants, no constants, no constants. Everybody got an S. Here there's a constant of D. And that is enough to tell me what A, B, and C, and D are. And actually, a very simple system. In real life, you'd be doing linear algebra here. A plus B is the coefficient of S cubed. The coefficient of S cubed over here is zero. It's B plus C, coefficient of S squared is zero. C plus D, coefficient of S on the left side is zero. D, the constant on the left side is two. So legally, that's four equations, four unknowns. But as a practical, practical matter, this is really easy to identify A, B, C, and D. D is already two, that makes C minus two. If C is minus two, that makes B two. And if B is two, that makes A minus two. So I picked something there that was kind of mellow. It never, comes out this nice. I mean, this can get really ugly. There can be more terms, there can be more mess, there can be more work. It is mechanical, but we can do it. Okay, now we're ready to fully decode. But still there's a work left. This is what I mean. The partial fraction decomposition, I can do many ways. The decoding, I still have to be careful with. Let's write this. Negative two over S plus one and positive two over S and minus two over S squared. I'm being very deliberate here for a reason, plus two over S cubed. I see that these things are gonna combine. And I could combine them, actually I'm not going to. As long as I follow legal steps, I'm okay. But here I need to do some prepping because there's nothing in my table that has two over S. I have to independently think of that as two times what? One over S. Then I know how to decode it. Likewise, there's nothing in my table that says negative two over S squared, but I do have something in my table called one over S squared. In my table, in my memory banks, in my mind. As things happen, there is a two over S squared in my table. And that is exactly what? That's from T squared. So this is prepping these. I have to respect these constants. I don't just fly off and say T, T, T. This one even needs to be prepped. I'm trying to do a little color coding. This is minus two. It's one over S plus one. Remember, I already had an S plus one there. Now I am fully ready 
to decode. This is e to the minus t. This is negative two times e to the minus t. Whether I added them before or after, it doesn't make any difference. This is plus two times one decoding. This is minus two times t decoding. This is plus t squared decoding. Final answer, negative e to the minus t plus t minus 2t plus t squared. Remember our driving function for this problem was t squared. Sorry, I have to keep my paper moving. Got that little lag happening. Driving function for this problem was t squared. So this part right here in the old days this is what I called the YP. Well, I can still call it the YP. This is the YH. This is what? Exponential decay. That comes from that part of the problem. This is beautifully logical. Wait a minute. I never took care of the initial conditions. Well, let's put in zero. Negative one plus two plus zero plus zero. Negative one plus two is one. The Laplace transform automatically took care of the initial condition. That's beautiful. So you see what this is? Laplace transform is like a machine that eats differential equations and spits out answers. Now there are other ways you could verify this answer because you know other techniques for doing this problem. You know a couple now. So I'm not gonna verify that this actually works. I'll let you verify that it works. But do you understand what the Laplace transform does? The Laplace transform eats differential equations and spits out answers. Now, I got to qualify that slightly. What differential equations does it eat? It eats linear differential equations. So it specializes in linear differential equations. And that's all that we're going to show you. And lest you think that that's too small or not worthwhile. So far, pay attention, I've only done mellow driving functions. Actually, the Laplace transform is excellent at crazy, crazy driving functions. Driving functions that look like this. driving functions that come in multiple strange pieces. This might look to you like a lot of work if I would have put that here instead of t squared. Like one, two, three, four separate problems, right? No, the Laplace transform does them all at once. So the Laplace transform is limited to linear differential equations, any order, but it's superpower is that it handles crazy driving functions. Uh, another word for crazy would be, in this case, real life driving functions. Okay, good, got it? Got it. Now, I'm gonna go back to my sheet right here. I'm gonna go back to this sheet because we did what we promised partially. We have done this. And we have done this. And then your response is, wow, you're really moving along there, Zippy. You promised us a lot more. That's true, I have promised you a lot more. To do it, I'm going to have to show you these two tricks. So let's show you these two tricks. That's what I want to talk about, the Laplace transform of the first shifting theorem. And the Laplace transform of higher derivatives. Neither one of them is difficult to deal with. But let's try first the Laplace transform of higher derivatives. So 
L of Y is, L of Y prime is SLY minus Y of zero. Let's try to take that to the second level. What's L of Y double prime? What about two derivatives? Just follow this form. According to this form, it is S times the Laplace transform of one derivative because the derivative of Y prime is Y double prime. I'm just following this form, kind of iterating it, recursively iterating it. But what do I have to subtract? I have to subtract Y prime at zero. Now this seems good, but it's kind of unfinished. What I want to do now is write y double prime in terms of y alone. So why don't we, but I know this part, I know it. So this is no problem. Why don't I insert this in that place? So watch, s, and then I'll insert the plus transform of y prime which is SOY, which is reading up here, minus Y of zero. Then I had this Y prime of zero over here. Now let's unpack it. So I can see it all at once, see my finished product. What I have is an S squared L of Y. And then I have S times Y at zero. And then on the end, there was this trailing Y prime of zero. And this is how the Laplace transform deals with the second derivative. Do you see every derivative is worth an S? Two derivatives worth two S's, but then I got to pay for them. But look at how I pay for them. Each time I add a derivative, I have to add payment. They want more payment, right? So what I do, look at the pattern. S squared, S to the first, S to the zero. There's an S to the zero attached to that. S to the zero is one. So as I pay for each derivative, I start out with that many S's, and then I count down with the S's. What do I do with the initial conditions? I count up. Y at zero. Y prime at zero. Y double prime at zero if I had it. And what does that give me? That gives me a full accounting of any derivative. Let's try it again. How about triple prime? I will not repeat this argument. I'll just follow the pattern. It should be S cubed, LY. And now what should I do? I should count down with the S's and count up with the derivatives until I run out of S's. So next is S squared, Y at zero. Start at Y at zero. Next, notice how I'm always subtracting. S one power, Y prime at zero. Got one more S to go. Subtract S to the zero power, which is one, no more S's, but I go up one derivative, Y double prime at zero. Now we had never done a triple order derivative. We've never done a three third order problem and we could, but it's not for, it's not for what we're into, right? But do you understand that you could take the Laplace transform of third order derivative? You just count down with the S's and up with the derivatives. First step is Laplace transform of Y. By the way, if you're counting up with the derivatives, if this is the derivative of the previous one, if this is the derivative of the previous one, it kind of hints that this is the derivative of this, or this is the derivative of this at zero. That means this is the integral of that. Well, Laplace transform is an integral. Uh, I don't want to be too mysterious, so just delete that if you don't want to listen to that. 
but I am counting down with the s powers and up with the derivative powers. There is an s to the zero right there. Okay, good. So we go back to our sheet and we check this off. And the sheet wrote the same thing, but it just wrote it in terms of the nth derivative. Sn, Sn minus one, Sn minus two, all the way down. Y of zero, some people call the zeroth derivative the original function, the zeroth derivative, first derivative, second derivative, all the way up. So we'll never use more than two derivatives. But if we need to, we got it. Second trick that you really need to know, both shifting theorems definitely, but this one that I'm calling the first shifting theorem is really important. So let me show you how to understand the first shifting theorem. In a way, I'm dipping into section 6.2 with this, with some of these presentations I'm giving now. But the payoff is big, because once I have the second shifting theorem, I can knock out the rest of these formulas just about. Okay, the first shifting theorem says this. Let's say that you know the Laplace transform of some function is this function, f of s. I don't care what this function is, but let's say you know one of these famous functions, like Laplace transform of t squared is two over s cubed. So let's say you know the Laplace transform of this. I'll do that with the word if. Now let's say you want to know what happens when you whack the function with an exponential. And you're very nervous because you know, you got that infinite improper integral problem definition. Like you say, oh, just because this one was easy doesn't make this one easy. What would it mean if I had to multiply by EAT and start all over again? And the answer is, you hardly notice it. This is the first shifting theorem. If the Laplace transform of f of t is capital F of s, then when you strike the f of t with an exponential, you hardly change the transform. Well, literally you do this. You shift the transform. And this is why it's called the first shifting theorem. Or some people just call it the shifting theorem, or the shifting theorem in the S domain. This, different people say different things. I, have, I wrote them first and second. Some people put them in the other order. I think possibly the book authors put them in the other order, but they don't use the word first and second directly. We'll just go with our presentation here. Let me show you how this works. And then I will show you why it's true, just like we did for the powers of t. So you know that the Laplace transform of t cubed is what? 3 factorial over s to the 3 plus 1. You know this straight from your table. Now you're nervous. You say, but what if someone wants me to do this Laplace transform tomorrow? E to the minus four T times T cubed. And the answer is, you're not even going to break a sweat. 
the answer is you can use the same transform that you already wrote. Sorry. Here's the transform of t cubed, the one that you know very well. What happens if someone slipped an e to the minus 4t in there? Do you have to start all over? The answer is no. You can use this transform that you know, and you can just shift it minus a, s minus a. Replace the s with s minus a. Replace every s with s minus a. There's only one s here. Be very careful to identify the a. The a is minus four. So when you say s minus a, you'll be saying s minus negative four. So here is the answer. Six over s plus four to the four. All I did was shift the transform. That's all I ever have to do when I use the first shifting theorem. Do you see how that automatically knocks out another formula? You know how to do t to the n. We just demonstrated one example. But what happens when you have t to the n e to the a t? You just replace the s with s minus a. Now, if a is a negative number, that's s plus four, like we just did. But if a is two, then it's s minus two. You just replace the a with s minus a. Replace the s with s minus a. That knocks out that one. Now look at these crazy sine and cosine formulas. I do understand that camera-wise, this may not be excellent unless you're blowing up this picture quite a bit. Remember, you have this sheet. Look at the formula for Laplace transform of cosine, and then look at the Laplace transform of exponential cosine, because we do a lot of exponential cosines in our differential equations, right? Exponential cosines, exponential sines, cosine sines. Cosine and sine have this funny pattern, and I'll show you where it comes from in a second. But look at the exponential times the cosine. It is exactly the same transform except each s was replaced by s minus a. Here's a sine transform. There's only one s, but I replace it with s minus a. Replace every s you see with s minus a. And that would get you these two people right here. Now legally, I can't circle them yet because I haven't shown you why the second shifting theorem, or the first shifting theorem is true. And I haven't shown you the sine and cosine transforms. But let's do that. So let's do the why. And when I say why, I mean why for a shifting theorem. This is where the magic comes in. This is where you got to do a little integral knowledge, but we can manage it. Oh, excuse me. So remember, if you want to do the Laplace transform of any function by the book, you have to do an improper integral. Zero to infinity, insert the function, e to the minus st dt. I haven't told you the philosophy of the zero to infinity e to the minus st dt. Maybe we could do that another time. So I insert e a t f of t. But then I can start to work on this a little bit because I can see, first of all, the e a t, the e to the minus st, they have common base. So I will bring those together and convert them to red. And that's a fast changing of those two, but I showed you how I added those two together to make that last time. Just left with the f of t right here. Now let's compare that to this the Laplace transform of f of t. The 
the Laplace transform of FT is naturally zero to infinity F of T E to the minus ST DT. Remember that is what I called F of S. Laplace transform, this is the raw definition. But look at our red thing above. Compare the red thing to the raw definition. It is exactly the same stroke for stroke, except at one place. Zero to infinity, zero to infinity, FT, F of T, DT, DT, E to the minus, E to the minus, T, T, E to the minus ST, E to the minus S minus AT. You see, the only difference is that in this case, the S has been replaced by S minus A. That literally means that whatever function comes out here, all I have to do is replace the S by S minus A. That's literally the same transform shifted. And now we've proven the first shifting theorem. Now we've proven the first shifting theorem. And say it to yourself in English, practice saying it to yourself in English. If you know the Laplace transform of a function well, then wrapping that function in an exponential shifts the transform. You're putting this exponential out front is like using it as a magnifier or as a amplitude of this function. That's actually the logic behind the transform in general. But using e to the at as an amplitude of this function. So I'm wrapping f of t in e to the at, for example. So if the Laplace transform of f is known, then wrapping f in an exponential just shifts the transform. That's how you say it to yourself in English. Okay, now I know how to do the first shifting theorem. And actually we're making progress and we're running out of time too. Uh, what are we gonna do here? Like I said, we're working ahead a little bit right now, which has value because it's going to make, remember, we got to close up the shop next week. So we want to be as prepped as we can. I will take minutes. I will put this on the recording and show you these two because you do two at once. They come in pairs. And then once I have those two, that will mean I have these two. And then we will have done what we've promised. We will have covered the great majority of this sheet. So let me do the last thing today. One more thing. Let's do the Laplace transform. of sine and cosine. And I could do this in multiple ways, but let's use my double derivative. I don't want to break anybody's bubble. It was the dumbest movie of all time. Well, everybody has their favorite movie that they love to hate. Mine was that movie with the kid and his Red Ranger BB gun. What is that a Christmas story? I don't hate things. 
you shouldn't hate things. And I hate that movie. <laughs> it's because I think it's like so silly. But what was the what was one of the taglines in that movie? I double dog dare you. So let's use our double dog derivative. Let's use our double dog Laplace transform. And watch what happens if I insert the sign of any angular frequency in here. That'll be my y. Now let's do two derivatives of sine. That, you know, we got to think about that for a second, but it's not so bad. First derivative of sine is minus cosine with an omega come out. So minus omega cosine. Next derivative, another omega comes out in the minus, sorry, first derivative of sine is omega cosine. And then the derivative of omega cosine will be minus omega squared sine. You could check this out, but that is the second derivative of sine omega t. Now let's fill in the constants. What's sine omega t at zero? Well, it's nothing. But the derivative of this is cosine omega t times omega, omega cos omega t. The derivative of that at zero is positive omega. I subtract positive omega. Now let's rewrite this. And you've learned this trick now many times. Put the sine omega t stuff on one side and everything else stays on the other side. This is actually zero. This is just a minus omega. Frankly, I just multiply everybody by minus one because I don't want to look at minus signs. What do I got here? S squared plus omega squared times Laplace transform of sine omega t. This is a lot better than doing that infinite improper integral, right? Equals omega. So now I just showed you that the Laplace transform of sine omega t is omega over s squared plus omega squared. If you ever forgot it, you could now do it. But frankly, you should just remember it. I could repeat this argument and I would learn this, that the cosine omega t gives me the same in one difference. Instead of an omega on top, I'll have an s on top because of how these terms change. You could practice it yourself. So these are twins, they're partners. And I wanna tell you something silly. I remember them by saying, which one has the s on top? The one with the s sign does not have the s on top. I just remember it by saying the s goes with cosine, the omega goes with sine. Both of them have an s squared plus omega squared on the bottom. Now we just showed you those two formulas. But by the first shifting theorem, we also showed you these two formulas. Okay, now we are in excellent shape for heading off into next week. And so I'm gonna wrap it up right there. This is page six. I wanted to work ahead a little bit, so we did. So thank you for being patient. Um, what do I want to say about this? So you're going to do a second order problem in your homework, and it's going to involve partial fraction decomposition. Oh, I didn't say that. I didn't say how to do Mathematica. Partial fraction decomposition. Let me show you. I'm sorry. I'll just show you very quickly in a notebook. You can look up this command. The command is called a part. And so what you do is you type in two divided by S cubed. We'll do the one that we did earlier, S plus one. And you say, you need to tell Mathematica what the variable is in case you have any other parameters laying around. But, and, and don't ask me how they named this, but the command is called a part. Excuse me. I'm just sliding that down the screen. 
So you just say a part and your function and S, the variable, and Mathematica breaks it apart. I don't know why they did that, but that's their name. You can look this up in the help menu if you want to. Okay, now you're equipped, but you should be able to do partial fraction decomposition also yourself. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the recording. I'll hang out for a second if you have a question, but other than that, that's good for today. Thank you.